Hi, everybody. Uh, Mike Kornbaum, Product Line Manager at Cloudgenix. We're going to talk about the uh, Cloudgenix and Zscaler Cloud Blade integration. So look at the environment overview here. We have the Cloudgenix controller with our uh, Zscaler Cloud Blade running with the API integrations with uh, the Zscaler and the Cloudgenix ions, right? So the only thing we need, of course, is a active Zscaler subscription and a Cloudgenix uh, native network. So you can see in our demo environment here, we have a single branch, is unconfigured, has no third-party VPN tunnels configured whatsoever. What we're going to do is now log into the Zscaler portal. We're going to generate an API key, right? That's our integration key in order for the Cloud Blade to be able to communicate with this particular subscription in Zscaler. Of course, we also need a, uh, a user account that can be used along with that API key. And then simply we come into the CloudGenix portal, go into the CloudBlades configuration screen, and we enter in that API key, the user credentials, and then which Zscaler cloud you're subscribed to, right? Zscaler has many different clouds. We happen to be using Zscaler 3 in this uh, example. And the integration point is really, really simple. It's a simple tagging process. We tag a site and say this site is going to be eligible to connect to Zscaler. That's Second, we have to say, well, which circuit types within our system are allowed to connect to Zscaler? So in this example, I'm saying anybody, any of the sites in my network that are internet cable type or internet DSL type are allowed to make uh, third-party tunnel connections up into the Zscaler cloud. Now, this is important because you might have, say, LTE, ne LTE connections that you do not want to build connections to Zscaler for whatever reason, right, for cost purposes. And then that's it. The Cloud Blade runs, it does its automation, right? It's, it, the Cloud Blade's constantly listening for changes into the, in the network. And when it notices a, a new site or a new circuit type was tagged, it goes and does work. And what's that work? Well, on the Zscaler side, they have a concept of a, of a location. So we create that Zscaler location. We create the VPN credentials automatically uh, and unique keys per VPN, uh, VPN tunnel per device. And then on CloudGenix, you can see the tunnels have been created. So now using that layer three through seven policy engine, where you have to say, well, which traffic do I want to send up to Zscaler, right? It's, you know, this is just the, a tunnel establishment. And of course, as part of the tunnel establishment, as was alluded to earlier, is that we pick the best performing node relative to this particular location over those e individual transports, right? So I had the cable connection and I had a DSL connection. So maybe I'm going to connect uh, to the Zscaler node, one in San Francisco and one in, in Houston, right? Because based off of latency checks. We also have the list of all of the available Zscaler nodes that this customer can actually connect to that's allowed through their subscription. Right, so if there is a potential failure, an outage, or if Zscaler does maintenance on, one of, on that Z node, we will automatically fail over to the next closest Z node over that particular transport. Right, so now we have to say, well, what type of traffic do I want to send up to Zscaler? And here, I'm just showing a very simplified policy. This is our L7 policy rules. So I'm looking at my generic uh, web browsing policy here, and I'm going to say, Third-party VPN on any public is my active path. And what service am I going to go to? I'm going to go to the Zscaler service. Right? And now using those L7 metrics, I'm going to say, well, which is the best performing path at that point in time? Right? In this example, I have two tunnels, uh, two transports. So what was the round trip time? Am I able to even establish a connection? Right? The, the uh, three-way handshake, it's TCP connection. Right? Am I able to establish a three-way handshake over that particular tunnel? If not, I'm going to use the alternate tunnel. If both are performing, user A is going to go over tunnel one, user B is going to go over tunnel, tunnel two. And you can see here then as soon as I made that configuration change, all my traffic is now migrated over from using the direct internet path to the third-party VPN paths. So there's kind of a potential for the, like a hidden node problem, right? Where the paths to the the to the Zscaler endpoints, you're monitoring those, and those are fine. 
but access to the actual services or applications that I'm trying to get to from from a particular endpoint may not be performing. Yep. One may be performing better than the other. Okay. How do you, is there, do you have any type of visibility into yeah, that? Abs absolutely, you're 100% correct, right? So that, so right, there's one reachability. Am I able to even connect up to the Z node, right? And then all that is a fallback process. The second is, am I able to even tran connect and transact through that Z node. So it's not just, can I send a SYN pack? Do I get a SYN pack back, right? And so we will detect that as a, an app reachability failure at layer seven. And if it fails, we'll fall over to an alternate path that's allowed by policy. Uh, and then we also give you deep analytics into how the applications are performing, right? And so we can look at things like round trip time. So if the RTT for that particular application is uh, above a threshold for not meeting the SLA that you set, we'll use the alternate path, right? For like a last mile problem mm -hmm. or mid mile problem up to the Z node. Now Zscaler being a, a proxy solution, right? Everything beyond that, we can detect if there's high server response time, right? Because the, the termination point is the Z node. Right. And so I should be able to see if it's elevated server response time. Right. Now, are we going to automatically react to that? No, we can't automatically react to that. Right. But we can give you visibility that yes, all of your flows that are going through this Z node are having high server response time. Go contact Zscaler, yeah. and t you can take manual corrective action at that point. Yeah, because right? really, this so isn't—it's not your. It's really in that point. It is Zscaler's, or you know, something beyond Zscaler's correct problem. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. But we'll give you that to the granular application level, and we'll even give it to the to the granular flow level. Right. Yeah. So my individual flow, we collect all of those metrics, round trip time, server response time, failure rate, transaction error rate, TCP level metrics like uh, out of order packets are all captured within our massive data lake. So somebody can go back in time and say, user A, you were having issues. Let me see what those metrics were at that point in time, not yeah. just at the aggregate level as well. Nice. So we really then give you this ability to have a, uh, that whitelist, grayless, blacklist model at the branch. Using our inbuilt uh, zone-based firewall at layer seven to do local uh, segmentation, then we can do uh, sending your grayless traffic up into Zscaler <clears throat> and then your trusted whitelist applications. Thank you. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Uh, yes. In your application, I don't see any WAN optimization or TCP optimization. You don't see a need for that application? That's, yeah. that's correct. Yeah, we don't see a need for okay. the WAN optimization. Why, why exactly? WAN optimization is a declining proposition, right? Okay. Think, think, think about it. What are all the, mo all of the modern applications, the modern protocols of today are now designed for the WAN? When, back when WAN optimization was, was popular, the protocols you were using, SMB v1, HTTP 1.0, they were all designed with the LAN in mind. Now we're using modern HTTP 2.0, TLS 1.2, so now everything's encrypted. SMB v3 is optimized for the WAN with uh, pipelining and uh, prefetching, and it's signed and encrypted. So the value prop for doing any sort of WAN optimization is greatly declined. So we, we don't want to add that extra complexity into the software stack. Yeah. And uh, you know the proof is in the pudding, right? We look at customers like Autodesk, uh, large CAD, CAD cam, they produce CAD cam software, eliminated uh, WAN optimization with Cloud Genix. Uh, you know, much like Mike described, what WAN optimization really solves for is for applications that were not written for the WAN, right? The big application was Filers, SIFS v1, where I think 1,200 conversations used to happen if you mm -hmm. double-click a filer, and you don't want that happening across the WAN, so you built uh, application-level proxies. Well, uh, SMB v2 resolves a whole bunch of that. Uh, your SaaS-based applications uh, resolve the application layer latencies. And then the DRE, right, what happens with uh, deduplication de is A, if it's encrypted, you lose the benefits of deduplication. Yes, you can do man in the middle SSL, which is a horrible idea, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Most customers don't do it. Uh, but what does DRE solve for you? It solves constrained network and solves it with storage at the branch. When the network becomes unconstrained with SD-WAN, what are you trying to solve? Yeah. All the TCP flow mitigations that uh, SD-WAN, that's the third thing that, that were brought in, unless you're running a, a, a software stack or your, or your operating system that hasn't been updated in the last five or six years, 
uh, you're going to have most of those benefits natively from the operating stacks. And that's the reason why you've seen dramatic declines in the fortunes of those traditional man optimization stacks. Yep. And I would say one more point on top of that is that requires book-ended solutions. Yeah. So now you have less options in terms of where you're going to send your traffic. So you, with CloudGenix, we can send our traffic to third-party services like Zscaler or just direct to the internet. Otherwise, with uh, other WAN op solutions, you're going to have to send it through a backhaul location where another node sits and they have to put nodes everywhere yep. in order to get that WAN optimization if you so choose. Yep. Interestingly, your competitor has a different opinion. Of course. <laughs> of course <they> do. <laughs> but that's what makes the industry interesting. Yep. Yep. You know, the reality is we allow uh, customers to speak for themselves. right? Uh, what we find is uh, almost every one of our customers have eliminated the need for those boxes. Now, you know, if you want to keep paying those expensive subscription fees, sure, why not? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.